SpaceX will attempt the first commercial spacewalk ever in less than a month. The Polaris Dawn launch date has slipped a little bit from net July 12th to now net July 31st, but we are getting closer and the crew has reached more training milestones, meaning that, yeah, we'll probably see this launch at the end of the month. You make a lot of progress over a long period of time, but then like when you're next up to launch, um, it's like the whole organization wakes up and they get rightfully very paranoid of did we miss anything and whatever you thought your schedule was whatever free time you thought you'd have gets thrown out and um and it's uh it's like you redo a bunch of tests and a bunch of simulations just to make sure it's right so that's been the last couple months for us is like it became clear that you know, the launch was coming. The Polaris Dawn mission is highly ambitious. The crew of four will travel 800 miles above Earth. And this is a huge moment for private space flight. This will be SpaceX's second all civilian mission after Inspiration4 in 2021 and the first of the Polaris Dawn launches. Polaris Dawn was originally announced in 2022. It's the first of three missions funded by billionaire Jared Isaacman, who I interviewed just a few weeks ago. Jared also sponsored Inspiration4. I hope that people understand how pivotal this launch will be. This mission will not only equip the spacecraft with Starlink Wi-Fi and test it in space, as well as reach a high orbit over 800 miles above Earth, that's the furthest out a human has gone from our planet since the Apollo era, but they'll also be conducting the first commercial spacewalk. And this is by no means going to be easy. You make no mistake about it. This is dangerous. Harvard astrophysicist Jonathan McDowell and I were talking about this recently, and he says that people really should understand how dangerous this mission could be. I actually had the pleasure of, of meeting uh, uh, Jared Isaacman and Kid Petit uh, a couple of weeks ago. They came to visit the, the Chandra Mission Control Center. This is by far a more ambitious thing to be doing as a private astronaut than just orbiting in a dragon, right? Yeah. The, this is one of the most dangerous things that astronauts do. Do not take it lightly. Opening the hatch, letting all the air out of your spaceship, having just this thin suit between you and the vacuum. We've seen the things that can go wrong with, with the, you know, again, Luca Parmitano with the, the, the water filling up in his helmet, the problems with toolkits floating away. We've seen having to cancel spacewalks because something isn't quite right on the, you know, on the electrical systems and and so um so this is dangerous mm -hmm. you know, make no mistake about it this is dangerous it of course clearly uh has the ability to um to position the polaris team and the spacex team to do much more ambitious missions in future so so there's a big upside to it but mm -hmm. uh i'll be watching very closely because because it's uh it's certainly um it's not a walk in the park. The Polaris Dawn team will be backed by SpaceX. They'll be carried in a Crew Dragon capsule, and they'll spend around five days in orbit. They'll fly so high above Earth that they'll actually pass through the Van Allen radiation belts. Those are rings of energetic particles trapped in Earth's magnetic field, and no one has gone through the Van Allen belts since the Apollo program ended in the early 1970s. So why do I keep talking about the spacewalk? Well, this will be the first spacewalk done outside of NASA or another government agency. And something that's absolutely crucial to the spacewalk is the spacesuit. And Jared shared on X that they are in the home stretch of training thanks to the hard work of SpaceX, Polaris, and NASA teams and they cleared a critical milestone last week. He says he and Kid Poteet recently trained seven hours in the vacuum chamber to get final confidence in their suits going into the launch. This completed a major milestone. These EVA suits are designed by Axiom and for SpaceX. NASA has been having its own issues with the current EVA spacesuits, and those issues have even delayed spacewalks. So how will they keep up with the aging systems? Well, one of the competitors for the replacement suit contract just dropped out, and it's another reason why I think the testing of the Axiom suits will be even more important going forward. The space suit, the, the delayed EVAs, first the EVA where um, uh, Dominic couldn't, couldn't fit into his suit properly or it was uncomfortable, and then the one where Tracy got 
squirted with water in her face uh, uh, and they had to cut it short uh, uh, with it before they got out the hatch. Uh, and so this is really, there's probably just a couple of unrelated incidents, right? But it makes you worry that the systems are aging and not working as well. And then the replacement suit, one of the competitors for the replacement suit contract just dropped out. Right. Uh, and and so the level of robustness of NASA's ability to provide spacesuits for spacewalks seems to be wearing a little thin. Uh, so that's, I think, you know, it's not terrible yet, but it's something to keep an eye on. Well, isn't that even more reason that this upcoming Polaris Dawn mission testing those new EVA suits will be pretty exciting? It is. This crew has been training together for over two years, and Jared recently spoke about this in an interview saying how bittersweet it will be to almost be done with the journey. By the way, speaking of sending astronauts into space, here's an update from Jonathan as well, or what we think might be an update on the Starliner mission. There's a lot of debate whether Butch and Sonny are stranded or stuck, and Jonathan says they're not. However, he doesn't think that communication has been exactly transparent. Boeing Starliner, Butch mm -hmm. and Sunny, what the hell is going on? Yeah, you know, it's really weird, mostly at, at what NASA are, are just not coming out and being willing to say, yeah, it's fine, We they can come home in a normal situation, we just want more data, that's all. Which I think is what's going on, right? I think that um you know they're the the systems are not they don't quite understand why the systems are behaving the way they're behaving so they need more test data and when they re-enter the service module is going to burn up and so if you want more test data in flight you've got to get it while it's still up hmm. and and so why not take the extra time and get that extra test data do the tests on the ground that will let you know what tests you might need to do in space. Uh, so they're waiting for that to come back to go, okay, so then the next thing we need to try is this. Uh, and that all makes sense. But, you know, the um, so what they said was, well, if there were a contingency, you know, there was an emergency, uh, we'd feel happy bringing uh, Butch and Sonny back on the Starliner uh, right away if that were, were necessary. And then, you know, a reporter asked them, so would you feel comfortable bringing them back even if there wasn't an emergency? And I thought they were going to answer, yeah, sure. We just don't want to do it yet because we need more data. But that's not what they said. And I don't understand why they didn't say that. Uh, um, you know, they waffled. They went on for about five more minutes without really answering the question. Uh, and so, you know, one that does make one wonder, is there some... You know, maybe there's someone who has an idea that, okay, yes, the leaks and the thruster issues are small now, but there's this scenario in which that could be a symptom of this worst thing that could happen and, and, and bite you, right? And and so we need to rule that out. And they're just not, but then they're not talking about that. So is it that, or is it just that these are engineers who don't even know how to talk to journalists and, and, mm -hmm. and aren't used to having to give a straight answer? Uh, and so I don't. I think it's probably the latter. I think I think it's just that these the public affairs people at NASA just don't know how to answer questions in a in a way that that, that will satisfy the media properly, um, which is you know sad. Uh, uh, but but maybe there's something that they're worried about that they're still investigating. I I just can't figure it out. I I you know I've seen a lot of kind of controversy over are they stuck? Are they stranded? And this you know people are debating whether whether or not they are. What do you think about those terms? Yeah, no, I don't think those terms are appropriate. Uh, I mean, clearly, I think, um, you know, the, the, the real question is, what, is, what would the level of risk be if they brought them home in Starliner right now, right? Do you think that there's any percentage that they would have to come home via SpaceX? I think it's super unlikely. I think we're a long, long way from that. Okay. That is always, you know, but that is the backup option, right? So, so the obvious thing to do would actually be, you know, crew nine is due in, I think, September or something like that um, with four people on board to go up, just launch it with two instead of four. Oh, but in September? 
Yeah, they got plenty of food. That would I read a report saying they have about four months worth of food. Yeah. So I, I mean, that would be crazy. Can you imagine just expecting to go up for a week and then stay? I, they 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 must have a decent video collection on ISS by now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, yeah. So so I I don't think. But the point is, if if it were if it were a point where you really didn't feel like it was safe to come home, that would be an option, right? Yeah. I don't think we're there. I don't think we're close to there. Um, I don't think there's any prospect that that will happen. I think I think that they will come home in Starliner. And they will probably come home in Starliner in the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, and it will be fine. Um, uh, but I just, I, you know, it's just that the ability of the NASA officials to explain their reasoning seems really poor. Yeah. I mean, is that like disappointing to you? Yeah, it is. I think, I think that, you know, I, I, I just don't understand. I, I, it's more confusing. I just don't understand why they, they don't, I don't understand why they don't understand <laughs> why what they're currently saying is causing these stories of stranding, right? I understand why some of the media are using words like stranding. It's not right, but yeah. I understand given the way that NASA are, are responding to the queries, I understand why particularly the non-specialist media uh, end up going that route. Right. And it would be quite, I think it would be quite easy for NASA to say some things that would squelch that. And they're, they're, they're just not saying it in a clear enough way. And, and uh, it puzzles me. So I'm very excited for the Polaris Dawn mission. I'm hoping that I'll be able to cover it. And I've tried to reach out to SpaceX without getting an answer yet, but I'll keep trying. I wasn't sure if the launch would be a conflict with a fashion show that I will be attending on July 20th. I'll actually be in a STEM themed fashion show, which why not? <laughs> I think it'll be fun, but I will try to cover the Polaris Dawn launch if I can. I would like to see if SpaceX will dish out some media credentials, but I'll keep you guys updated on that. But it would be really cool to watch this launch. Jared will also be a speaker at the X Takeover in San Luis Obispo, California, and I will also be a speaker there later this month, July 27th and 28th. Get ready for the ultimate celebration of innovation and sustainability. I'll be speaking at the X Takeover event. It is July 27th and 28th in San Luis Obispo, California. It used to be called the Tesla Takeover, but instead of just focusing on Tesla, SpaceX has now joined the party and it's called the X Takeover. I will also be speaking on a SpaceX panel, which I'm a little bit nervous for. Also, if you attend, you'll be able to listen to this year's keynote speakers, Tesla chief designer Franz von Holzhausen and billionaire and SpaceX astronaut Jared Isaacman. There will be over 40 exhibitors, including the opportunity to get your Tesla detailed or wrapped on site. And here's a special offer. Use the promo code CYBER10 to get 10% off your registration fee. Register now to secure your tickets and I'll see you there. So hopefully if you guys are going to that, you'll be able to see me. I'll be speaking on a space panel and I'm really looking forward to it. But to everyone who has supported my channel, thank you so much for helping me get to where I am. It's been truly incredible to see the growth and I'm so excited for the future of Ellie in space. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for your support. If you guys enjoyed this video and all of my Starship coverage, please subscribe to Ellie in Space. It's completely free and that way you won't miss any future videos. If you wanna take it a step further, please consider signing up for my Patreon. YouTube revenue can be very unpredictable and hit or miss. And you guys on my Patreon are why I'm able to take these trips and help me experience the life that I'm very thankful to live down here at Starbase and many of the other places that I've gone to report for the channel and the places that I'll be going in the future.